welcome everyone who's come to join us. Um, great to see you. Um, and hopefully it's going to be a really interesting session. Um, we've got Ed Druitt with us, who is a local naturalist. Um, he's got lots of knowledge and expertise he's going to share with us to think about um, what wildlife do can we expect to see in Willsbridge? What's already there? Um, what, what could we maybe encourage to come? What might we, we be able to entice into the neighbourhood by creating more habitat? Um, and this is kind of born out of the Common Connections project. So I'm the engagement officer for the Common Connections project. And it's a four year project funded by the West of England Combined Authority. Um, and it's habitat improvement and trying to deliver biodiversity net gain, which is a kind of fancy way of saying we want there to be more species at the end of our work than there were when we started. Um, so we've got 87 sites, which include 10 schools, and we're all along the East Bristol fringe. So we're sort of as far up as Lyde Green, Willsbridge is our southernmost area, and then over to Wick, that triangle. Um, so it's an area where there's quite a lot of development pressure. Um, and we're trying to make sure that we can look after and protect the, route, the sites that are most beneficial for wildlife um, and add to them and make them even better for wildlife. So um, we're creating lots of green corridors as part of the wider regional nature recovery strategy. So that includes lots of wildflower planting and orchards and pond creation and tree planting and hedgerows. Um, and so we do some community events that people can come along to and join in planting with us. Um, and we do some at schools and we do some that's kind of contracted in um, as well so that we can cover as many bases as we can. Um, and one of the aspects of the project is that we're trying to um, help people understand what they can do in their own back gardens. So if we if we think about the amount of, um, you know, land potential wildlife habitat is in people's back gardens, then there's actually quite a, a huge amount that we could, you know, make beneficial for wildlife. So this session is partly geared towards that, but it's also linked up with the RSPB Big Garden Bird Watch and our in-person event on Sunday, which is at Willsbridge Mill. Still spots left for that. I shall put links in the chat so you can book onto that. Come along and have a walk with us. Take home a tree for your garden or a habitat box. Um, but I'll uh, I'll leave it there and hand over to Ed's capable hands, um, and we'll we'll definitely have some time for Q and A at the end if anyone has any burning questions about um, what they can do in their garden. Thanks, Ed. Lovely. Thanks, Jenny, and uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm going to share my screen right now. There we go. So my name is Ed Druitt, as Jenny said, and I'm a local naturalist. I'm often uh, um, around Bristol showing people wildlife and as Jenny said what I'm going to do tonight is to talk a little bit about the sort of wildlife that we might get around our gardens and green spaces in Willsbridge and it's sort of in the second part of it really sort of talking a little bit more about all the different sort of things that you could do little things single things that you can do to help um, wildlife. What I want to do first of all is just to just take a little step just across the border from Willsbridge into Bristol actually. This is at Troopers Hill Nature Reserve in St George which is just down the road from Willsbridge and um, I, I love trying to get a sort of landscape picture and from Troopers Hill actually you can get a view sort of west southwest from Troopers Hill across towards Bristol um, but what I like about this is it just shows you really how kind of Bristol South Gloucestershire which kind of merge into each other really in the end. Very green, there is a lot of connectivity, there's a lots of trees, and of course there's a lot of urban areas in between. But I think it's quite useful really just stepping away because obviously when you're at ground level all the time, you're not always aware of kind of what's around you, what's above you and how wildlife, whether it's birds, whether it's bats and insects actually, um, how they are connecting with all these different spaces and somewhere like St George, sorry, a Troopers Hill is a good place to sort of just get a feel of um, where Willsbridge is kind of connecting up with the with the wider kind of landscape. Now, wherever you are around South Gosses here in Bristol, just thinking further afield here, whether you've got um, a small space that might be paved, but you've got potted plants, whether you've got water down by the river, this is the docks here in Bristol, but of course it could well be the River Avon, very close to Wheelsbridge and the Froome, um, whether you've actually got a much larger greener garden, all these different spaces can offer wildlife um, a refuge, food in somewhere or another. And the key thing really 
which is kind of related to what Jenny's just been talking about, really, is this kind of idea of connectivity and the fact that when you've got, if you're a dragonfly or a bat or a hoverfly, that even if you're in quite an urban space, as long as there's still places where you can feed or places where you can lay your eggs uh, in these kind of grey spaces, then that's still going to be good for wildlife. Of course, at the moment we're in winter time, and many of our uh, animals uh, and plants as well are kind of tucked away. Really, we've obviously not had quite a snow event like that this year, although other parts of the country have. But wherever you are living as a resident. It's also about that bigger picture of what else is around Willsbridge, for example. So here we've got an allotment, for example, not too far away from Willsbridge, uh, which which has lots of fantastic hedgerows, lots of amazing plants being grown, not just the vegetables and fruit, but also all the other stuff in between. And so what I'd love you to go away with tonight is also thinking about how your space at home at Willsbridge fits in with that bigger picture around Willsbridge. And also perhaps beyond those boundaries of Willsbridge will, because of course it doesn't just live in its own little sphere, it's all part of the wider countryside. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go on to birds in a moment, but what I want to do before I go on to birds is just think about all the smaller stuff because we always notice the big stuff, we might notice the squirrels, we might notice the birds, but it's it's down to the fact that we've got all the stuff going on below them that we have them there, really. So when we're thinking about our spaces that we have around Willsbridge, we're thinking about, for example, spring blossom. This is hawthorn, but we know, for example, that willow, particularly uh, pussy willow or sallow, for example, which has these catkins very early in the year, provides really important early nectar and pollen for not just honeybees and bumblebees, but also hoverflies and solitary bees that might be coming out in March time. So there's lots of little things that we can be planting. And as Jenny said, there's going to be some free plants some free trees to pick up on the weekend on Sunday that actually if you if you're if you're eager to have something like that in your garden, like cherry blossom, for example, um, then we've actually got some of those, you know, that you can take away with you to put into your uh, space. I think the other thing also is about us. Um, not being too tidy as well. So we can see this kind of space here on the edge of a garden allotment here, lots of different plants growing up here, and that provides lots of different foliage, lots of different opportunities really for insects to live. It's the Big Garden Bird Watch this Sunday, and so there's a real opportunity to see uh, and count the birds that are in your garden. And Willsbridge, um, because it's got this fantastic kind of river valley coming through it, it's very close to hedgerows in the countryside, there's lots of great birds to be counting. And the Big Garden Bird Watch has been going on for the last 30 years or so, and it does offer a kind of annual opportunity to see how birds are faring in our garden. There is also a survey. Um, called the Garden Bird Watch, run by the British Trust of Ornithology, where you can submit your results weekly. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But what I want to do to start off with is just give you the chance um, to perhaps write down what you think these nine different birds are, and then we'll go through them. So if you've just got something to write there or off, not just think in your head what these nine different birds are, I'll just give you sort of um, 15, 20 seconds or so. Just have a little look at what you think these are. And then what we'll do is we'll um, see if people want to actually say what they are. You can just come off uh, your mic or something like that and just tell us what, what these different species are. I'm going to go through some of these anyway. So some of these are probably quite easy, but some of them might be a little bit harder. So does anybody want to hazard a guess? Uh, or, or knows confidently what the number one bird is. What's the first bird here? And uh, feel free to come off your mic, uh, turn your mic on if you want to shout it out. Anybody going to have a go? There's a guess on the chat, Charlotte's um, put a suggestion in. What is it, sorry? Charlotte said, is it a wren? Ah, it is. Yeah. So the number one there is our second smallest bird in Willsbridge. This is the wren. Exactly. Brilliant. Now, number two should be a little bit more obvious for people. Um, we've got the robin here, of course, a very common bird around Willsbridge. What about number three with a spotty chest? I'll give you a clue. This loves to eat snails in the summertime. 
and often bangs its the snails against a special stone called an anvil. Anybody know what this one is? No, Charlotte's guessing a song thrush. Yeah, this is a song thrush. So if anybody else has an inkling of some of these birds, do feel free, if any of you a guest, to pop them in the uh, maybe the chat. So we've got a song thrush here. Number four. Anybody know what number four is? This is a bird that might well come through your garden or your green space in a, in a flock. It's also a very small bird with a long tail. Wendy's saying it's, is it a long tailed tit? Yeah, so this is a long tailed tit. And actually, as we go more into February time, long tailed tits are going to stop sort of going around in these big flocks. They'll be going around more in pairs. Um, number five, if you do have bird feeders in your garden, I'm sure that this is a, a familiar bird that you might well see quite often. Anybody know what this one is? Uh, number five, is it a blue tit? Yes, this is a blue tit. Yeah. What about number six? This is probably a familiar bird to a lot of you. It's a blackbird. <laughs> yeah, blackbird. Number seven. Now, number seven is interesting because this is not a bird you might get, say, more towards Troopers Hill and 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 Canesham, but it's certainly a bird that where you've got the woodland, the wet woodland around Wheels, which you're going to see. Anybody know what this one is? Well, I thought it was a tree creeper, but some people are putting nut hatching. Ah, yeah. So it's a nut hatch. Yeah. So the tree creeper is brown with a white breast and it kind of goes up the trees like a little mouse. And um, then the nut hatch has this lovely peachy breast and this blue grey back and head. And it tends to go up and down and along the trees in, in, a, in a much more exaggerated way than the tree creeper. Yeah. Uh, number eight. Anybody know what number eight is? Great tit is the guest on the shirt. Yep, so this is the great tit, and at this time of the year, you're very likely to hear it going teacher, teacher, teacher. And number nine, this is a shy bird, but again, it's a bird we will get around uh, Willsbridge, particularly on maybe quieter mornings when there's not too many people around. Male bullfinch is the Yes, name. yeah. So this is the male bullfinch. There we go. There's all the names there. So don't worry if you didn't know what some of these birds were. It was more just an opportunity just to have a little think about the range of birds that we can get uh, around Willsbridge. And as I started off at the start, just showing you some of those different sorts of gardens, really. And of course, different gardens with different foods will attract uh, different birds at different times of the year. So let's think a little bit about uh, some of these birds, first of all. So the blue tit. This is a classic bird that will come to your bird feeder, uh, feeding on nuts and seeds. But it's also one of the most common birds that will come to the nest box as well. So if you have got a nest box, this is one of the first birds that will come and investigate it. If you already got a nest box up, you may already see activity happening. And that's where the birds are investigating the boxes. It's also where they may come and uh, sleep at night. So even before they start making their nest during February, March time, they may well what we call roost in the box. Here we've got the blue tit and the great tit together. The great tit's about 20 percent bigger, a little bit bigger with a much broader black breast band coming down its uh, body there. They will also use nest boxes, um, perhaps not quite as uh, much as the blue tits, but um, but certainly will still use them as well. Now, the house sparrow is another interesting bird, and, and this is, is so house sparrows are an interesting bird around Willsbridge because they're the sort of bird that down one street, you may have a whole flock of them, and down another street, there may be none. These birds like scruffy places, they like thick hedgerows, they like the kind of front hedge that somebody might have in their front garden that's nice and tight and, and uh, quite, quite um, mature. And they, because they love to socialise in these bushes, and they also like to nest under the tiles on people's eaves. And uh, there are particular tiles. So there's been some studies done on this in Bristol and often council housing type tiles are often best for, ha for, for house sparrows. And interestingly enough, the more sort of expensive housing areas like Clifton and Bristol um, don't provide quite the right tiling for them to be able to get under. So um, but certainly around Willsbridge, this is going to be a bird where uh, certainly if you're putting seed out for birds, they're going to come down. But they are a flocking species. They're a social bird. Um, so, again, scruffy bushes, scruffy hedgerows near where you are are going to be ideal places for the house sparrow. This is the male with the grey on the top of the head, the lovely chestnut brown on the back of the head and the female there. A bit more sort of straw coloured and brownish, but always chirping away. Another bird that you may well see around Willsbridge as well, particularly on your roof at this time of the year, is the starling. Now, South Gloucestershire does get lots of starlings coming here from Eastern Europe and Russia, 
but you'll usually you know your local starlings because as we go into February time, these will often be singing on your TV aerials or neighbours TV aerials. They might be investigating holes under the eaves of your roofs and things like that. This is a beautiful male starling, really glossy plumage, yellow beak with a blue base. And they're often singing on the tops of our roofs and TV aerials attracting a mate. Now, we don't have so many starlings as we used to have. They've declined by about 70 percent, 60, 70 percent, maybe more actually over the last 30 years or so. So again, providing food for them. At this time of the year, they love fat balls and they'll come into your garden eating the fat balls, often in quite a loud, gregarious group. People don't always like them. I love them. I think they're very fascinating birds. And the fact that they are not as common as they used to be um, perhaps makes me appreciate them even more. And if you do see these in your local park or you see them in your garden, you can tell the difference because as we go more into February, March time, they'll develop a yellow beak. So a lot of them will have a black beak at the moment and the females will develop a yellow beak that has a pink base, if you see it well enough, and, and quite often a white eye ring. And then the male starlings will have blue at the base. So it's quite easy to remember blue for the boy, pink for the girl. With starlings, it's true to form and you'll see that in your garden as we go more into the springtime. Now, we had the wren a little bit earlier on. This is our second smallest bird. Now, wrens are almost like a little kind of garden mouse, but but the bird type. They're very good at scurrying in amongst the brambles, the compost heap. They often go undetected, but they're one of our commonest garden birds that we have in Willsbridge. And they'll start singing from now onwards, really, often on a, a post or a, a, an obvious branch. They've got this little tiny tail that they have cocked up. So definitely a bird to be looking out for. Their Latin name is Troglodytes, which means kind of cave dweller, because they're very good at getting in all these little spaces, dark spaces, looking for wood lice and centipedes, millipedes and all sorts of other little goodies like that. Another bird that you might well spot in your garden this month is the dunnock. Some of you may know this is by its old name of hedge sparrow, not a sparrow at all. It's an ancentor, uh, which uh, if you've any of you have been skiing in the Alps, you might see it's relatively alpine ancentor. But in Willsbridge, it's a lovely little quiet garden bird with a greyish head and a sparrow like body and reddish colour legs. And if you see these birds doing little flaps of their wings, I haven't got the picture there of it. Um, this is where you've got an alpha male and a beta male. You've got a dominant male and a less dominant male. And they're just kind of kind of telling each other who's who. And uh, you might often get several males with several females um, showing off in your garden. So that's the Dunnock. Uh, female blackbird. Now, blackbirds will just be starting to sing very soon. You should start to hear the beautiful kind of fluty song of the blackbird very soon. This is a female blackbird. They can start nesting from sort of middle of February onwards, but more likely middle of March. And of course, a great bird looking for worms. And when it gets very icy like last week, they're often going to be looking for seeds and apples, which I'll come on to in a moment. Here's our lovely male blackbird with the black plumage, yellow eye ring and a yellow beak. If you see what looks like a male blackbird that has a very dark beak at this time of the year, it'll be a young blackbird from last year. It'll be a first winter bird. And here's our lovely song thrush. So as I mentioned earlier, because Wills Bridge is along a lovely wooded valley, great place for song thrushes to be singing, great place for song thrushes to be kind of coming out of the woodlands and into your gardens looking for um, tidbits. But in the summertime, June, July time, particularly looking for slugs and snails to feed their chicks on. And you may also be lucky enough to see the red wing. This is a bird that comes from Sweden and Norway. We get lots of them coming to South Gloucestershire at this time of the year. They're often feeding on berries such as hawthorn berries. But when we get into February, March time, particularly if there's not too much frost, they'll be down on the ground feeding on earthworms and other soil invertebrates, as well as apples that you might have out. They're a bit like the song thrush, but they've got a white stripe across their eye, a yellow base to the beak, and they've got this little orange, reddish orange patch just under their wing. As we get into springtime, but even at this time of the year, you may also sometimes spot a very tiny bird about the size of a blue tit, yellowy colour called a chiff chaff. And as we go into March time, you might start hearing the chiff chaffs. They go tick tack, tick tack, tick tack. They start saying their name, basically. Um, we do get them wintering in uh, in and around Willsbridge, particularly where there's the sewage works. 
but you may also sometimes get these in your garden. And as we go into late February, March time, they are a bird that definitely could be uh, looking for insects and flies around bushes and trees in your garden. We saw the long tail tit earlier and, and whereas you might see blue tits and great tits coming to your garden all day long, with long tailed tits they tend to come in a flock often once a day, maybe in the morning, maybe in the afternoon, and they go roving around your neighbourhood basically looking for food. And as we get into February time they'll start to break off into pairs and make their nests and they make these fantastic springy nests out of lichens and mosses, often in bramble bushes, and uh, and if they fail um, then actually they may go and help brothers and sisters or aunts and uncles in other nests nearby which is rather quite cute. Another bird to look out for as well uh, is the smallest bird in Britain, the gold crest. This is even smaller than the wren, often quite discreet but often around evergreen trees, holly, yew, pine trees, leylandii trees you might have in your garden, very squeaky little birds, very, very small with a little yellow crest. So definitely worth looking at. And you can see they're much different to the wren. The wren is a very brown bird with a cocktail, whereas the gold crest is very small, discreet, often just fluttering around, can be quite tame. So definitely a bird to look out for. So just a little selection of some of the birds there that you could spot in your garden. And with the big garden bird which coming up this weekend, what sort of things can you be putting out for the birds? particularly when we have the cold weather like we had the other day, but even so, there's still not as much food out there as there would be in the spring. So on the top there, you can see there's lots of apples, grapes. On the left hand side, we've got some mealworms. I'll go through this in a bit more detail. And the greyish seeds there are sunflower hearts, a little bit more expensive than, uh, or a bit more expensive than sunflower seeds, which can leave a lot of mess, but really liked by the birds. And birds are very good just like you and I really, of needing and wanting a, a varied diet. So we want to give birds lots of different foods really, one to suit different species that feed in particular ways, but also so that they can actually get a good different diet. I must add that even when you do put food in your, in your garden, birds are very good though at still going off and finding natural food. So I'm often seeing blue tits in my garden still trying to feed naturally, great tits still going off to look for spiders and snails and things like that. So often foods in our gardens are supplementary. It's not always a case of all or nothing unless we get really cold weather. So on the top left we've got peanuts which nut hatches and woodpeckers like, sunflower seeds and sunflower hearts which are loved by the tits and the finches, the high energy mixes which are liked by the sparrows, and the mealworms are loved by your robins and your wrens and your blackbirds. And then the fat balls are also liked by woodpeckers, nuthatches and, and also starlings. And, and so many of these things you can get from local pet shops. I'd be very careful of some of the cheap bird foods, though, because quite often they can have rolled dried peas, rolled dried sweet corn, and uh, they are often only really good for pigeons. And uh, I'm not dissing pigeons, I love pigeons, but they don't tend to provide the food that your smaller birds need and want. So you're wanting to look for high energy mixes that have got a nice mix of small seeds in them and sunflower seeds that are going to provide the food for those smaller birds. Of course, around Wheelsbridge, you're going to have grey squirrels and grey squirrels are very good at destroying bird feeders. So it's often quite good to look for squirrel proof feeders that have a kind of netting around them, a mesh like you can see here, that allow the birds to get in but stop the squirrels getting in, certainly for uh, a certain while. Sometimes they can get in, but uh, generally a good thing to think about. This was last week in my garden. I've actually got something called a squirrel buster. They're a bit more money. They're about 60, 70 pounds, but it's for me, it's been all worth that money because instead of continuing trying to buy these feeders that the squirrels destroy, I've had this one now for seven years and what it is is the squirrels put their weight on the lower part of it to get to the food and there's a spring which pulls the part of the bird feeder down over the food and they can't get it and they only try it once or twice and then they don't try again after that because they realise that they can't get to the food. This is another one that I've got which is a slightly smaller one again when the squirrel sits on it it goes down but you know, not everybody's going to be able to afford these feeders, but there are squirrel proof feeders which are much cheaper and still do a good job.
Ed, we this had a question um, yeah. last year at uh, uh, AWOL um, from Angela, which was um, she was saying that she likes to feed the birds, but um, they have a lot of bigger birds that scare off the smaller ones. So yeah. she wanted some ideas on how do you feed all the different ones? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think a variety of foods can be quite good. I mean, obviously, the, some of the big ones you're going to get sometimes are your magpies, your jackdaws, your crows and your wood pigeons quite often. Um, if if I'm getting too many wood pigeons or the squirrels are becoming a bit of a pain because I've put a lot of food on the ground, um, then I try to just stick to the feeders. So I just try and stick to the squirrel proof feeders and, and what have you. What you tend to find is that birds are very messy. So the goldfinches, the sparrows, they tend to. And then if you ever watch the tits, they'll sometimes take a seed out of the bird feed and drop it and then they'll get another one another one because they're very good at detecting when a seed is really good or it's fat content they're very good at detecting the healthy nest of a seed and so those seeds then fall to the ground and then provide food for your blackbirds and your other things obviously you can also put things like apples out uh, chopped apples although sometimes my squirrels nick those as well but i think it's about it's about trying to provide a number of different sorts of feeders and different sorts of ways with different sorts of foods um and again i think if you go for those kind of, for example, those high energy mixes that have got much smaller seeds in them, they tend to appeal much more to your sparrows and your greenfinches and your chaffinches. Um, and the squirrels and the woodpigeons tend to leave those alone a little bit more. But it's not easy. If you've got if you've got lots of the bigger stuff coming in, it's not always um, easy because, you know, they will come down and be very opportunistic and, 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 and obviously take those. But I think it's about variety. It's also sometimes about having feeders in different parts of the garden as well. Quite often depends what sort of space you've got. But if you can spread things around the garden and have some things under the bushes or tucked away a little bit more, then the likelihood is, is that that food's going to go to the perhaps the species you want it to go to. This is my own garden here. This is back in the summertime. So I've got my bird feeders here, but lots of different spaces for wildlife in lots of different kind of layers and, and what have you. There's a few tits and things just coming down to the bird feeder here. At this time of the year, apples are a great food to put out for birds. Uh, your grey squirrels will eat them as well, but certainly blackbirds, red wings, song thrushes will appreciate apples. And because they've got a high sugar content, they tend to freeze at a much lower temperature than the soil does. So they tend to stay quite palatable and easy to get into for the birds. Also, just going back to your question about catering for different species, this is a, a kind of stump I've got in my garden. And during the cold weather last week, I was putting some mealworms and sunflower seeds on there. It's quite close to this uh, big mesh of, of cut uh, branches I've got. So quite good for things like wood mice and some of the little birds and, and easily uh, those mealworms went, you know, quite unnoticed to anything bigger. Water is also important for birds and other wildlife too. And if you don't want to or can't afford um, a nice bird bath like these two, then this is what I put out last week. Just one of my uh, kids kind of plastic uh, food bowls. This one's been out for a while, you can see, but it had been upside down for a bit. So I just put it out. And even though it was getting a little film of ice on top, when something's plastic like this, it's obviously much easier to break and get the water out of. Whereas obviously something that's concrete or ceramic, uh, if you start bashing it with a hammer or <laughs> start putting hot water into it, it'll just crack and obviously break up. So a plastic bowl like this is cheap and easy. And it means that you can easily replenish the water very quickly and easily for the birds. But water is important, not just for drinking, but also for washing. And you'd be amazed at how birds will have a really good wash on a cold, frosty day to keep their plumage in tip top condition so they can keep warm. At this time of the year, we're also thinking about bird boxes, too. This is a blue tip box, um, which actually has got some baby great tits in it. But bird boxes. The reason we talk about bird boxes is because even around the River Valley, around Willsbridge, many of the trees won't be very old. Even if the oak trees are 100 to 200 years old, that's quite young for an oak tree. Oak trees won't start getting their holes and their hollows really until they're three to 400 years old, unless, unless they've had some branch trauma. So most of our trees that we have around Willsbridge and South Gloucestershire are just simply not old enough to have enough holes for bats and birds and things like that. So that's why we do encourage bird boxes. And, and um, you can actually, through the British Asphalt Authority, record the number of eggs, the number of chicks that you have in a bird box. You can get bird boxes where you can lift up the flaps 
maybe once a week so you're not disturbing the birds too much and you can actually count the number of eggs they usually lay an egg a day uh, you can count the number of chicks and how many chicks then leave the nest and things like that and you can submit those details to the British Astral Ornithology and it's really fun to do uh, the birds won't desert the nest and, uh, and and in this case you know I was just keeping a check on how many baby great tits there were this is another box I think this was one with some baby blue tits and actually this has got lots of rabbit fur lining the nest here but putting out hair dog hair sheep's wool um, and things like that are great things that the birds can line their nests with here's some sheep's wool i've got a little ceramic um thing really which the birds take uh, i've seen siskins taking this great tits and blue tits goldfinches taking this to line their nest this is my a part of my garden at the moment and what i've done is one thing we often encourage is even if you want to still have uh, a mown lawn is is to perhaps put a bit of it aside for wildflowers and not necessarily just simply letting it go but um, for example um, the Avon Wildlife Trusts grow wilder um, oh, I've just forgotten the name Jenny of, of uh, what's it called um, is it grow wild? Yeah, it's grow wilder. Yeah, grow wilder is right. It is grow wilder yeah. Yep. So near Stapleton have got a fantastic nursery where you can buy little plug plants of wildflowers that we would get in wildflower meadows. And although this is looking very untidy and scruffy at the moment, this is just perfect. I've got a mole which keeps putting up little mole hills, which is great for um, seeds to germinate. These leaves that are left here are going to go down into the soil for the earthworms and enrich the soil. But in this little patch of lawn that I've planted up with wildflowers there are also wildflowers such as knapweed and scabious and um, um, what else we've got here sorrel a bird's foot trefoil which provide lots of nectar um, behind where I've taken the photograph there is still some lawn uh, lawn is good for ants it's also where my children can still play and we can still sit and enjoy the garden but what we've done really is is provided um, some space for nature on our lawn uh, as well and this is kind of what it looks like in the summertime. It becomes this amazing jungle of wild flowers providing lots of different foods. And just like the winter food, if you have lots of different varieties of wild flowers, whether they're ornamental or whether they're kind of wildflower varieties, then you're going to provide lots of different foods for those bumblebees, those hoverflies, those moths at night. Those in turn are going to provide food for your slow worms, for your birds and for your bats. Uh, so here you can see there's some nice scabious here, for example. Uh, we've got a little bit of we've got a small apple tree here there's some knapweed in the background this is knapweed just in front of us here as well just about to flower um so lots of opportunity here and it's amazing how it transforms from this kind of ground level uh meadow to this wonderful kind of jungle in the springtime and you can also get some absolutely exquisite flowers growing this is salad bernet which the leaves taste a little bit like cucumber you get these in wild flower meadows you can get these from grow wild or grow these in your garden and they've got these exquisite um anthers that produce the pollen and then on top there the ovaries the which are connecting that pollen and then turning those into seeds here we've got some greater knapweed that I got from Grow Wilder and a bumblebee there getting its long tongue into the pollen and the nectar there, for example. A little beetle just on top, a little flower beetle. If I go back there and have a look, you can see some, there's a couple of little flower beetles just in that flower as well, just moving around, collecting some of that pollen. And uh, you may well then get things like burnet moths as well. Here we've got um, a carder bee, a common carder bee coming to bird's foot trefoil, for example. So all these wonderful things will come to your gardens around Willsbridge if you provide them. Something else that uh, you can easily do as well is put some corrugated metal or some corrugated sheeting down. This I got from NHBS.com. It's made out of a more fibrous uh, material and this is really good for ants. It's really good for small mammals. I've got a little field vole nest under it at the moment, but uh, it's also there for the uh, lizards to bask on and around Willsbridge these these sorts of things are going to be good for uh, slow worms to bark so having something like some sheeting or maybe even just a, a square of carpet somewhere it, anything that's going to warm up a little bit more quickly than the surrounding garden and lawn is going to provide a great place for reptiles and ants and things like that to hang out and uh, survive log piles are really good as well so if you've cut some uh, recently cut some branches or uh, you've had to trim a tree then actually putting those into a pile will provide some great food for fungi um, some great damp spaces for wood lice centipedes millipedes earwigs 
Um, but also you'll start to see over six months to a year, lots of holes appearing where beetle larvae uh, are living. They're feeding and chewing on those uh, logs and then coming out as adults, which of course then provide food for your birds, for your bats uh, and your other creatures that are living in your garden. So these are some of the log piles that I've got in my garden here and some of the brash as well, some of the branches that come off our beech tree. I'm just being I just leave piled up there and uh, and just leave it nice and scruffy. Really, it's amazing how you'll get things like the lizards and slow worms coming out to bask and log piles like this can also provide basking opportunities for butterflies uh, in the springtime and also insects as well, such as tiger beetles, which might come into your garden. Another thing to consider as well is connectivity. So Jenny at the start was talking about um, how the, the Connections project really is thinking about uh, connecting up gardens, connecting up landscapes around South Gloucestershire. And one problem obviously some wildlife have is that we can we can end up with our gardens being like prisons. Although bats and birds and things can get into our gardens, things like hedgehogs, slow worms can't necessarily get in unless we give them the opportunity to. And even if you've got fencing that has little gaps between it that isn't always big enough for something like a hedgehog so what we can do is we can simply take little uh, make little holes in our fencing so here for example on my back garden fence I've actually just taken out a little bit of one of the fence pillars here um, so it gives something like a hedgehog a bit more space to get into the garden and out again because hedgehogs don't just use one garden they use lots of gardens and ideally if we want them to keep away from roads and things we want to give them the opportunity to get in between so here's a kind of slightly more potter version a much smoother looking version with a hedgehog coming through um, but here on the left hand side you can see someone's actually gone quite industrial and actually made a hole in their uh, the wall of their garden and on the right hand side here you can see someone has made a hole in the bottom part of their fence here but I think one thing I would think get you to think about really is connectivity how things can get in and out of your garden um, and whether your garden perhaps is a barrier for some of the things that you want to be coming into your garden to eat your slugs to eat your snails but also just to bring some delight you know to to, to bring some diversity to your to your space that you have at home uh, or if you're living in a flat um, you know perhaps encouraging uh, you know other other people in your flats to do something in the green spaces that you've got or or the the governance that might be overseeing the flats to 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 agree to something uh, happening uh, but nonetheless things like hedgehogs will certainly be very happy to come in and out of uh, of your garden and 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 uh, make their way through other things you can do we often see in, and i think jenny was talking about this about having some sort of nests and and, and insect boxes and you can certainly buy some from from different garden centers and stuff like that today but what I've done naturally here if you look closely here you can see there's some old stems with holes in them and these are actually from fennel or teasel stems and these provide a really good opportunity for things like solitary bees to come along lay their eggs inside and then plaster it up in the springtime and these need to be at least 25 centimeters long some of the ones you get in the supermarkets and garden centers are only 15 centimeters long they're not always long enough so you want something that's 25 centimeters long and stems of things like fennel and teasel are perfect for this so if you grow fennel or teasel in your garden or do it this year, you'll have lovely dried stems that you can then poke into things like my compost heap or this wood pile next year. Ed, we had a question as well about this. Um, uh, I think it was Fiona has um, a very successful bee hotel at the moment. Fabulous. But what she's finding is that because this, it's it's got so many residents, it's attracting parasites. Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about that. So the parasites, um, I think by that you're meaning parasitoid wasps, maybe. So the ones that come along and, and uh, probe their ovipositor, that long needle like thing that I showed you earlier into the nests. Um, I think that's probably what you're meaning. So what you will do is that when, when yeah. you do have. Yeah. So when you have solitary bees and things like that, it will draw in your solitary wasps. What I would say, though, is that is that. That, that is a good thing if you've got if you've got your solitary wasps that is indicating to you that actually you've got functioning garden that's actually telling you that you've got you've got healthy garden but not just your garden hopefully your neighbors as well so I wouldn't worry too much about that the bees the solitary bees do have techniques and ways in which they can put the uh, the the parasitoids off um, and also, once those solitary bees are, you know, once they seal up those little 
uh, holes in, in your bee, bee hotels, then obviously those solitary wasps can't get in as well. So although they might be hanging around the bee hotel, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're always being successful. And even if they are being successful at times, that's actually part of the natural balance. There will still be solitary bees that, 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 uh, that are successful. It's really interesting, actually. I'll just go on that point, actually, because my wife and I um, had loads of eggs of large white butterflies this year on her um, broccoli stems. So we decided to put some in a tank uh, for our children to watch grow up. And we literally ended up with probably 200 plus large white caterpillars. But you know what? By the end of it, we only ended up with one butterfly. And you know what the reason for that is because before my wife and I had even brought the eggs into a tank, parasitoid wasps had already laid their eggs into the eggs of the large white caterpillars. So we ended up with these caterpillars, but they gradually, slowly got eaten alive. And we just ended up with this one large white butterfly. But you know what, that, that, if we didn't have that in place, we would be overrun with caterpillars and butterflies. So there's all this balance. Now, obviously, there is some offsetting because obviously with all the bad things that are going on in the world and, and with our wildlife and stuff like that, obviously we do want and need more butterflies. But I think the key thing is that the parasitoids are not the problem. They're, 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 they're telling us that there's a healthy thing going on. Um, so that's definitely um, um, a, a positive thing and I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, um, Leaf litter. Too many times we remove leaf litter. Leaf litter is important for the health of our soil. It's putting nutrients back into it. Also, when it's over the soil, it's helping to keep the carbon. It's helping to keep the carbon locked in your garden rather than escaping to the air. But you know what? Last year, I was just poking around in the soil in the leaf litter trying to plant something. And I found a newt, a hibernating newt. And that newt could so easily have been scooped up in that leaf litter and put into the green uh, green bin or onto the compost heap and, and, and lost. So leaf litter is important for hibernating invertebrates at this time of the year, your slugs, your snails, all the and your predators. But it's also good for things like newts and frogs and uh, other things that will be hibernating at this time of the year. Something else to consider is a pond. Now, we know that lots of different size water bodies in our gardens and in our green spaces are good for wildlife. We've lost far too many ponds over the last hundred years and we need to bring some of those back. And if we have lots of different size ponds in different gardens around Willsbridge, then we're going to end up with a fantastic mosaic and connectivity of ponds. And this is one that I put in where there used to be a shed about seven or eight years ago doing this with natural with them. Um, uh, a butane, a butane uh, layer here but obviously there's different ways of doing ponds and what have you this is what it looked like in 2017 uh, we put in a few uh, different water plants again you can get some native water plants from Grow Wilder and this is it now uh, it's uh, it's an amazing uh, wildlife garden pond and the wonderful thing about ponds is they attract wildlife immediately because things like pond skaters water boatmen they all fly and then when water birds or other water creatures come into your pond they bring eggs with them from other animals and things like that so isn't that a transformation there we love the pond we've and we've gone from one frog to last year having 10 frogs and frogs are very good at detecting water and so as soon as you put a pond in place you're very likely to get frogs again especially if you've got good connectivity between your garden and, and other gardens and here's a little uh water lout, for example that i was uh, doing a little bit of tom pond dipping with my uh, kids last summer there just just crawling around and this is it at the moment. This is a photograph of it last week um, during the icy weather. Um, but there's already a frog in there. We've got newts in there. Again, previously, this was uh, the base of a dilapidated shed when we moved in. Uh, and now there are just such a great plethora of different different wildlife living in the pond. And also the birds come down to drink in it every day. Every day there are blackbirds, blue tits, robins, wrens coming down to drink and washing it. And it's a real pleasure to watch them doing it. And if you've got a camera trap, you can put a camera trap out to watch them. But of course, it doesn't have to be huge. Uh, this is an example of a small pond here where you can often buy maybe the shelves of the pond and put little bricks in and, and water. And um, and, you know, it could even be, for example, uh, an old sink that you've blocked up. Um, and I think the key thing is just making sure that creatures like frogs can get in and out. Um, so, you know, if you're putting a sink 
into the ground, making sure there are little stones for them to get out again, because obviously it's a slippery sides. Um, or if it's going to be just sat in your backyard, making sure that there are ways in which creatures can get in and out uh, and what have you. But uh, bring water to your garden or your green space and it will really transform what else is coming to your garden. And actually going back to your question about how do you cater for the small stuff when the big stuff is there, water is a great thing to do because even if the magpies and woodpigeons are taking all the food, there will always still be space for those those small birds to come down and have a wash and have a drink. Now, something else that can be very simple if you've got a dog is rather than using um, something like spot on or any chemicals on your dog hair, which basically is often containing neonicotinoids, which are lethal to insects and bees, but also lethal to watery invertebrates, um, is to actually get flea tablets and things like that. So these days we shouldn't be putting stuff onto the fur of our cats and dogs. There are more environmentally friendly and better for your animals and you really ways in which uh, these animals can actually swallow something that helps to get rid of fleas and things like that. Um, the reason I mention this is because it's it's a quick win, because if you have a dog and it goes into the river at Willsbridge Mill or it goes into local ponds, if it does have spot on or something like that on its fur, that washes off into the water body and will affect obviously the water life there. Um, so for me, that's a that's a real kind of quick win. And I was speaking to a vet about this recently who was saying the one thing that people can do if they have a pet like a dog is to not use anything like spot on or sprays and get flea tablets. Look into it because that would be one really easy win um, to help wildlife. Right, I just want to finish off now with uh, just a few more shots of pollinators. So as we're going into February, March time, Queen bumblebees, honeybees, solitary bees are going to be starting to come out. And if you have willow or sallow in your garden, this is a really fantastic plant to have because the early catkins provide them with some really good early food. So even if it's a bit late for this spring, certainly next spring, think about putting like something like willow or sallow into your garden because it really does provide an important early food. And also crocuses, crocuses in your lawn Getting more crocuses can also be a really good way of helping those queen bumblebees when they first come out of hibernation over the next few weeks or so. Also, later in the year, think about things like sedums. Um, a lot of these, they're not called sedums anymore. They're called hylotelephiums, um, but I still call them sedums. But in, later in the season, these provide late summer food for honeybees and this wonderful second generation uh, small copper which you can see here feeding. We've got a, a solitary bee on the left feeding here and this wonderful small copper here. So we're thinking about willow, sallow early in the season and then late in the season, we're thinking about things like sal um, sedum. Here we've got a wonderful honeybees coming to feed late in the season, getting some last nectar and honey before they um, hibernate for the winter. Another really good plant for later in the year as well is Devil's Bit Scabus. This likes quite marshy land, but grows well in my well-drained garden as well. And this also provides late food for insects into August, September time. Final couple of slides now. Um, something else to, uh, I think, keep in mind is ivy. Now, it is an absolute complete myth that ivy is bad for trees and if you go for a walk around Wheelsbridge and Wheelsbridge Mill you will see lots of it on trees and I always my heart sinks when I see when somebody has cut the stem of a fantastic ivy growth going up a tree it won't it's not like the strangler fig that you get in tropical countries which will kill the tree Ivy will use the tree as support, but it's not killing the tree. It's one of our most important um, sort of woodland habitats on trees. This is actually looking into the hollow of a tree here, which could easily be used by hibernating bats and owls. This was actually an owl roost here. But ivy is really important. And at this time of the year, ivy is developing its berries. And these produce berries that, that provide important food for birds, not just now, but particularly in March, April time. So there's a bit of a, a food famine 
in March, April time when a lot of food isn't available to birds like finches and thrushes. And if we get very cold April Mays, blackbirds and song thrushes, robins will feed on ivy berries to keep them going. So really important. And again, another quick win. Just leave the ivy where it is. It's also a really important roosting habitat, a sleeping habitat for birds uh, and small mammals. It's also an important nesting habitat as well. And it does provide some shade and cover, um, particularly with our warming climate. It's a really good way of providing some shade and cover um, for trees in woodland areas. All right, I hope that's that's given you a really um, inspirational kind of ideas of different simple things you can do. I think the key thing about providing space for wildlife is it's not about trying to do everything. We don't necessarily have the time or the space or the money to be able to do everything for wildlife but I hope that the slides this evening have given you a little bit of inspiration of maybe just one thing that you could do that could make a difference or if you are doing some of those things one thing that perhaps you might be able to convince your other members of your family or a neighbour or a friend to do um, who might be reluctant to do some of those things but might be up for doing one of those things. I'd like to just mention now the Big Garden Bear Watch we, we, we've we've designed this kind of this this talk tonight and, and the walks on the weekend around the Big Garden Bird Watch. Um, as I say, this is an opportunity to record um, all the maximum number of birds that come into your garden. And if you go onto the RSPB's website, it'll be there on the front page. And uh, this was last week, quarter of a million people signed up. There's usually over a million people take part. Um, and you can do it any time of the day for an hour, watch your garden. Uh, whenever I do it, most of the birds that I normally get in the garden all disappear for that hour normally, but that doesn't matter. And I think the other thing is that even if you only get one bird or no birds in your garden, that is just as important. So please, please take part. Um, even if you don't see anything or you only see one thing, that is just as important as if you're getting 20 species in your garden and of those you're getting about 100 birds or something like that. So please take part. And if you come along on Sunday to either of the walks that we're doing, 11.30 and 12.30, then you've got the chance to walk around the area at Wheelsbridge Mill with me and we can do some watching and we can do some listening and uh, give you a chance to um, have a go at spotting some of these things yourself. If you like the idea of watching your garden birds and recording them and you're not already doing this, then you can join the British House of Ornithologists Garden Bird Watch and this is where you can actually count the birds in your garden weekly but what's really fantastic about this is you can also record the mammals in your garden, you can record the butterflies, the dragonflies, the amphibians in your garden. If you see any ill birds in your garden you can also record that. So look the Garden Bird Watch up because this is something where you can record the birds in your garden weekly uh, either just as a tick you've seen them or the numbers that you see as well and if you can't do a week you just leave it out um you just you just you just say that you haven't done that week so it's, it's you know you don't have to do every single week it's just um but it's a great way of contributing all year round to what's coming into your garden well i hope that's been inspirational i hope it's been interesting i hope it's given you some ideas and i hope that maybe we will see some or all of you on sunday because not only do you get the chance to have a guided walk with me there's going to be cake tea, coffee and the chance for you to take away some free trees and some free homes for wildlife. So hopefully that's a great incentive for you to come along and find out a bit more about some of the things that uh, I've been talking about this evening that relate to where you live in Willsbridge. Thank you. Back to you, Jenny. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, that was really rich. There was lots of information to take in there. I was taking notes myself of the things that I want to do <laughs> in my garden. <laughs> um, I just wanted to check if was there were there any questions that we haven't yet covered that anyone had to, uh, whilst we've got Ed here for a few minutes. I don't know if sometimes, I managed to remember them. Uh, all that's right. All sometimes people need a moment or two just to um, think about any questions that they might have. So um, um, digest. That's right. One thing I would say while anybody might be thinking about questions is um, you might sometimes find that your gardens are quiet for birds at times. So my garden was really busy last week with the icy weather. It's been much quieter in the last few days. And that's because once the ice melts, the birds are able to find natural foods again. So blackbirds, for example, I had about 10 blackbirds in my garden last week. I've only seen two or three today. Um, they're very good at knowing that your garden's there and coming in when they need it and then using the wider kind of countryside around wheels, which when they don't. 
don't. And um, you'll find in late summer you don't get so many birds because, again, there's plenty of food out there for them and uh, they'll use your gardens or green spaces as and when they need to. Oh, anybody else? Anybody else want to ask anything? I can't. I wondered, Ed, um, I don't know whether we missed any slides before your um, your number when we were guessing the birds and you were talking about the insects a bit more. So any kind of key bits that you think we should know about that? Right. Yes. So some of the, uh, when I was yabbing, uh, talking for 10 minutes <laughs> and I had no audience without realising it, apologies. Um, what I was really getting at really was I was talking about the fact that we, it, I always like to try and think about the bigger picture really. So when we have our um, birds come into the garden it's thinking about what makes a garden healthy so despite you know thinking perhaps thinking a bit less about providing the artificial food for the birds and how do we provide space for wildlife in our garden and what I was trying to get at was thinking about the smaller stuff lower down so if we provide the flowers if we provide all these different kind of scruffy places that I was talking about, then we provide homes for lace wings and ladybirds and earwigs and those parasitoid wasps that I was talking about. Um, and these are all predators of things like aphids and caterpillars, for example. So if you have hoverflies coming to feed on nectar or wildflowers in your garden, hoverflies are really good at laying their eggs next to aphids, for example, and those grubs will then hatch out and eat your aphids. Before you spray aphids, just be tempted to not use sprays ever again, because if you have aphids suddenly on something, I can absolutely guarantee that if you hold your nerve for two weeks at the most, those aphids will become shells. Because what happens is, is that if they don't get eaten by the hoverfly larvae or ladybird larvae, a parasitoid wasp, a tiny parasitoid wasp comes along and lays its eggs in all of those aphids and suddenly overnight after a couple of weeks they all get eaten and you're just left with a ship with shells of these aphids. I can absolutely guarantee you it. So really what I was talking about was the fact that you know to have the big stuff in your garden you've got to nurture the small stuff so by having little scruffy patches, leaving a leaf litter, leaving a little bit of bramble here having your dandelions as you know providing as much nectar as possible is going to nurture the the predators the ladybirds the lace wings it's also going to provide food for your moths um so i was talking about the fact that moths are one of our most important pollinators and if you've got dandelions coming up over the next week or two or the next month or two sorry leave them because dandelions along with sallow provide some really important food for our insects just as they're emerging and then the seeds of the dandelions provide important seeds for birds like goldfinches greenfinches and bullfinches during that famine during april time so we leave our dandelions and we get all the solitary bees and the bumblebees and the honeybees and the hoverflies feeding on them in march and april time followed by the goldfinches and the bullfinches and the greenfinches feeding on them uh, a few weeks later. So it's all about nurturing all of that small stuff. And then if you've got that small stuff, you're then going to bring in your birds. So even during the summertime when I've got artificial food out, there's still plenty of insect life to feed the um, to feed the birds, to provide invertebrates for your hedgehogs, um, slow worms, providing slugs, for example, for your slow worms and things like that. Um, so I think I was, I was talking about slow worms as well and the fact that gardens around South Gloucestershire and Willsbury are very good for slow worms. Slow worms like scruffy patches in your garden. They come out at dusk and they feed in your slugs. So it's all about having the right foods and the right variety. And if you've got a good balance in your garden of parasitoids and predators, then you won't have a slug problem. You won't have a snail problem. The only reason people have slug and snail problems is because there is an imbalance. And even if you may not be using chemicals in your garden, it might be that neighbours are. And um, if you can encourage neighbours to also garden wildlife friendly and not use chemicals, for example, then then over time you will find that you don't have a snail or slug problem because the hedgehogs will eat them. The song thrushes will eat them. The slow worms will eat them. And parasitoid wasps will lay their eggs into the slugs and snails and also eat them. And all and, and all these things disappear. Your parasitoid wasps disappear when there are 
phrase being used, insecticides being used. So really that first part you're missing in a nutshell was all about nurturing those, those predator, those prey, invertebrates in your garden because if you get those right and you get your soil right conditioned with all your leaves and everything else then you're going to get all the bigger stuff coming to your gardens wow and and jenny says there very rightly so that the royal horticultural society has rebranded weeds as plant heroes i don't use the word weed the word weed is a subjective word and it doesn't have to be used there are other words you can use instead um you know weeds are are just it's just the name of a plant that is in the wrong place that we think is in the wrong place and anything could be a weed really but i don't use the word anymore um and uh and i think that's great they are plant heroes because actually most plants we regard as weeds in our garden are in fact some of the most important plants for um our pollinators and for feeding our predators that actually are going to make your gardens even healthier I think we there's, what, there's, there. there's <laughs> one more one question in the chat from Charlotte, which is um, about her allotment. So is there anything extra they can do? They've already got a small pond and a bug hotel. Wonderful. Well, I think I mean, I think with the bug hotel, um, again, you know, if you are growing fennel, if you are growing teasel, you know, making sure you've got those 25 centimetre long uh, tunnels really because some of the bug hotels can be uh, a bit shorter than that. So just making sure you've got that going on. Um, you probably probably doing complementary planting, but but you know where you are growing vegetables and things, having those complementary plants like nasturtiums, but trying to get maybe wildflowers um, in there, getting your bird's foot trifol, um, you know, getting your nap weeds, great nap weeds, getting your scabies in there. So having patches of those wildflower plants, for example, from Grow Wilder, so that so that in a you know because. Things like nasturtiums and marigolds are lovely, but marigolds, for example, aren't great for wild bees and hoverflies because they've got quite a complicated flower head. Um, so, again, if you are getting flower heads, get ones that have got very simple flower heads or are native. The more complicated a flower head becomes with multiple petals and stuff, um, then they're often not much good for our pollinators because they can't get into them. So the more native something is and the more simpler it is <laughs> for an animal to get in and feed, um, the better it's going to be. Um, yeah. Right. I think we better um, stop stealing your time, Ed. You you very patiently repeated yourself <laughs> from having done the talk and then started doing it again. For no, us. that's my pleasure. And I just <laughs> apologise that I I um I just thought everything was fine, <laughs> so I apologise <laughs> that you missed some of that. But thank everybody for the staying on, and I really hope to see some of you on on Sunday. Yes, fingers crossed. Do book on, guys, and do register your gardens as well. The links are in the chat, and I shall send them out with an email tomorrow morning as well. So hope to meet some of you on Sunday. Thanks, Ed.